expand our imagination. And welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bob Schaefer. Well, Washington is talking about the Tea Party's grassroots movement. It's going to be on display Saturday uh, for Glenn Beck's Restoring Honor Rally, which is going to be down at the uh, Lincoln Memorial. The uh, event has come under fire from some, especially some civil rights leaders, for being held on the same day as the anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s historic I Have a Dream speech at the very spot uh, where... Uh, the Reverend King spoke. Well, former congressman and the chairman of Freedom Works, Dick Armey, is going to join us uh, here to talk about uh, his new book that he's written called uh, Liberty, a Tea Party Manifesto, and also about this uh, this rally that's going to be held uh, tomorrow. Um, nice to have you, uh, uh, Mr. Army. Uh, some people say you're the uh, father of the uh, Tea Party movement. Uh, I'm old enough to say to you, some are also saying you're the grandfather of the Tea Party <laughs> movement. Uh, which which actually are you? Well, first of all, let me just say I've been both a father and a grandfather, and being a grandfather is a better deal. But it sure is. The, the Tea Party movie is so authentic. Now, the, about the only claim that I would have to leadership in this whole event was uh, our organization, Freedom Works, been doing this a lot of years. Folks who wanted to get organized from across the country came to us and said, uh, help us get organized, and we were a bit of a mentor to them. But for anybody in the world to say, I'm in charge or I found it, it is basically a delusion of adequacy. Uh, I want to come back and talk a little bit about that and, and a little bit about your book too, but let's uh, let's talk about this rally that the uh, uh, Fox News personality uh, Glenn Beck is right. holding down at the uh, Lincoln Memorial. He calls it restoring honor. Uh, there are some on the left who say it's it's in fact a sacrilege because of where it's being held and, and when it's being held, the anniversary of uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Uh, your group, I, I'm told, is uh, busing in some folks or furnishing transportation for some to come there? No, we never, we never furnish, <laughs> excuse me, we never furnish transportation. That's one of the <coughs> misconceptions. We have a good complementary relationship with Glenn Beck. Uh, we think of him as the instructional arm of the grassroots movement that uh, help people remember our heritage, especially the wisdom of our founding fathers. Uh, his, he, his work is always so, so well documented, you can't argue with it. And we are the activist arm. So we have this good relationship. Now we've advised our folks, please come, please attend. This is an opportunity for you to once again uh, immerse yourself in the heritage of the nation, refresh your commitment. Well, what, what exactly is this rally? I mean, what, what is it about? I mean, because as you well know, there are some folks that uh, are just uh, really upset that it's being held, where it's being held, and, and on the date of the anniversary of Dr. King's speech. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry that they, it's, I think it's unfortunate that they've upset themselves. Martin Luther King's uh, stand on the Lincoln Memorial was about let's have a nation of unity, put color aside, let's talk about the character of the nation, let's go into people's hearts and, and minds, what do they think, how do they feel, what do they believe, do they love freedom, do they love equality? This is exactly what Glenn Beck's doing. I w if I were had been there with Martin Luther King, I personally today would say, isn't it wonderful? Well, that once again we have a group of people that are willing to come to this spot and celebrate these great ideas of freedom and equality and uh, acceptance. Uh, so I, I, I can't believe anybody thinks that Martin Luther King stood there and said, you know, all these years uh, in the future, let's make sure there's a separateness in America over somebody else wanting to stand here. I, I guess what has upset some people is the fact <clears throat> that uh, Glenn Beck has made some very controversial <clears throat> virtual statements on, on race. I mean, saying, amongst other things, I believe that Obama, President Obama, has a hatred of white people. Well, I don't know. I've never heard him say these things, and whether or not they've said that thing, uh, those things, uh, uh, it, it st still doesn't discount. It's not about an individual person. It's not about a single person or a quarrel between two people. It's about whether or not you look at the heritage of this great nation, understand the wisdom uh, of our founding fathers, if you understand the pledges and the commitments, and people have gone to the fields of battle and died over in order to make sure others could be free and free to express one another. Uh, I, my own view is uh, in politics and among people who have a involvement with politics, there's a tendency to unnecessarily stir one's 
oneself up in order to score a political point. And uh, you know, I've always put that, whether it's coming from the right or the left, is down as silliness. And this reaction to uh, Glenn Beck, I don't take as a very serious intellectual exercise. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about just the Tea Party in general. Uh, you've had some uh, you've had some wins and you've uh, had some losses. It seems to me during this uh, during this primary season, one of your big wins. Uh, if it turns out that he has won, is Joe Miller up in Alaska, who it appears at this point uh, has upset Lisa Murkowski, mm -hmm. the incumbent senator up, up there. This is somebody who came out of nowhere. Uh, you say you knew who he was mm -hmm. and what he was up to, but I think it's fair to say a lot of people, a lot of people didn't. Uh, it would take, it seems to me, a near miracle for her to turn this thing around now. They are recounting right. the votes, but uh, she's behind now and, and she's gonna have to do a lot better, it seems to me, than she's doing to, to wind up the winner up there. What, what, what do you think, what was that all about? Well, the, 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 the Joe Miller incident, as we see it, is just another case that, that of a long string of cases that actually started with Marco Rubio down in Florida, uh, the New York 23, that controversial race, the situation in Boston, even, even the governor of New Jersey, where our grassroots activists looking at the Republican Party see the lay of the land better than the party itself does. Mm -hmm. And they, they exercise a strong commitment of activity on behalf of the candidate that they see within that primary, do the same on the Democrat side if they found the opportunity, that candidate that they think is more true to the founding principles of these nations, especially in, in juxtaposition, as you saw in Utah, for example, against an incumbent that has disappointed them on these founding principles of liberty, small government, constitutional restraint. Well, you know, one of the ways that the Democratic National Committee is trying to picture your candidates is, uh, quite frankly, is nutballs in yeah, some cases right. and saying that they are so extreme that there's no way they're going to do well in November. Right. In fact, here, here's part of an ad that they, they put out today mm -hmm. uh, about Joe Miller. Let's just take mm -hmm. a look, quick look at this. Tea Party candidate Joe Miller is poised to upset incumbent Senator Lisa Murkowski. Miller is backed by former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin. About employment compensation benefits have got it. First of all, it's not constitutionally authorized. I think that's the first thing that's got to be looked at. So I do not favor their extension. Ultimately, we've got to transition out of the Social Security arrangement and go into more of a privatization. You know, and it's not that radical of an idea. And uh, the end of that ad says these people may actually be in charge. And, and w it's going to be pretty hard, isn't it, uh, for a for a candidate says he wants to get rid of Social Security, that is a fairly extreme position. Mr. Well, he's Arnold. not saying he wants to get rid of Social Security. He's saying he wants people to have the choice. And the fact of the matter is, when he makes the point private accounts is not a radical idea, that's exactly what came out of the Senate in 1935. It was only when the White House weighed in with the House in conference against the Senate that it became a mandatory participation for every citizen in the government-run program. So private accounts is not that radical a choice, and it's got, certainly got in actually good standing uh, across the country. But what you're seeing with the Democrats today in their discourse and in their political paid ads uh, are the acts of a fairly, uh, frankly, panicked political party. They are losing. They're losing big time. They see it happening. They don't know how to stem the tide. And of course, they always attack what they fear. So they, uh, they will, again, they, they, they will attack Joe now as they will everybody else. But, I mean, you, uh, you must concede. You are seeing down in Kentucky Rand Paul. He's talking, you know, about reviewing the 1964 right. Civil Rights no, Act. No, he's not. Uh, right. You're talking about uh, some of these other candidates, talking about including right. Joe Miller doing away with the Department of Education right. and the Department of Energy. Uh, I mean, they, they, you don't agree that those no, might no, be no, rather, I, I, rather Ursula, extreme positions? No, because again, one of the fundamental MOs of all political operations is the bum rap. Rand Ball made the startling uh, point that had I been in the Senate in 1965, where in the year in which by more than by Republican votes than by Democrat votes, we passed the Civil Rights Act, but had he been there, as a senator who had sworn an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, there would have been a healthy constitutional debate about the constitutionality of many provisions of the bill. That's your duty as a senator. 
I mean, the idea that it is radical and extreme to, to examine the constitutionality of any potential limit by a person whose oath of office requires him to swear allegiance to that Constitution is a little bit stunning to me. Well, if that's radical, then, you know, uh, what are we supposed to do? What, Why what, take the oath? Why don't we say, I swear an oath to good manners? I mean, well, if you swear an oath, it's an oath is a serious matter. How do you feel about the civil rights legislation that was? I passed think the in civil rights states? legislation that was passed in '65 was it, it was a fine. Uh, my biggest uh, uh, feeling about it is I'm sorry it was necessary. It shouldn't have had to have been necessary. I'm glad we can now move beyond that. But the fact of the matter is the constitutionality of that law or any other law like this health care law. Uh, uh, has to be examined by people who swear an oath to the Constitution. That's your duty in that office. Do you think uh, the Tea Party is more of a problem for establishment Republicans, or is it uh, uh, more of a problem for Democrats? Well, in this primary season, it's been a big problem for establishment Republicans. There been five or six or, or so uh, incumbents have lost their chance to have their job back. Uh, it will be, of course, a larger problem to a great many more Democrats in the general election because it is the defining swing vote in America. And the Democrats know that. They want the Tea Party to do for the Republicans what Ralph Nader and the Green Party did for the Democrats, and they're frustrated to tears that it's not happening. And what is the name of your book and what's My it about? My book is uh, Give Us Liberty and it is the true authentic history of the Tea Party, how it really happened, how it came about, and how the fact that you can't find a leader is in fact prima facie evidence it's authentic. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Thanks for, having for being me. with us. And turning to something entirely different now, our Kaylee Hartung is here because uh, our favorite museum, the Newseum, has a new exhibit opening uh, today, I believe it is. Kaylee, tell us about it. That's right, Bob. Covering Katrina, the newest exhibit at the Newseum opens today. Here visitors can learn of the many challenges reporters faced while fighting to cover the most destructive hurricane in U.S. history. Newseum CEO Charles Overby gave me an early look. Southeastern Mississippi, well, mandatory uh, evacuation. This was huge page one news around the world, and these front pages show it in a dramatic way. Big headlines, and you know, the reader knows when they see these front pages, this is one of the biggest stories that's going to happen, uh, certainly of the year, maybe their lifetimes. So we have, what is this, five days? Five days of stories? worth, 80 front pages from around the world. This weather bulletin that was issued the day before the hurricane hit shows that it was not a secret about how bad it was going to be. The visitors to the museum read this and they just shake their head. But as we see throughout this exhibit, uh, the, the government was not ready for it. The Weather Service got it, the media got it, but the federal government didn't get it. The theme of this whole exhibit is really represented right here in this panel danger and despair. It was danger for the reporters, danger obviously the people who were victims, and the despair. Just you see this picture and you realize uh, the despair. And then this headline, thank God the press is here. That's not something you hear every no, day. No, <laughs> that's a, just the opposite normally. The logistics of covering Katrina were almost uh, unfathomable. And this quote from the New Orleans Times-Picayune reporter that it was much easier logistically to work in Baghdad than it was in New Orleans. He had just come back from Baghdad, and it's just hard to understand how, in a war uh, situation, that that would be easier to cover than Katrina. I think one of the most uh, grim and touching things in this whole exhibit is this map of death. The Biloxi newspaper put up a map in the newsroom, and as they got word of a death, they put up a pen that had the person's name and address on it. it. Started with one, and then it was two, and it built up to more than a hundred. These bicycles were used by reporters from the Times Picayune, and what makes this so important is that uh, everybody thought New Orleans had dodged the bullet, and uh, they got these reporters on the bicycle, and they went out from downtown, and they discovered that the levees had broken. The sign, we had a plan, was so important. Stan Tyner, the editor of the Biloxi newspaper, uh, planned uh, as much as you can 
before this. Hurricanes are no stranger to the Gulf Coast. What they did have to deal with is everything that they knew was gone. And this is a reporter's notebook. Reporters writing their stories out in longhand. You don't right. see that much That's these days. That's exactly right. Of course, they had no electricity, and so they just had to do makeshift to get it out. And good. these reporters, who are pack rats, saved this. I'm sure they'll have this for the rest of their lives. This project must have taken a lot of cooperation from the New Orleans Times-Picayune and also the Biloxi Sun-Herald. The editors and reporters in New Orleans and Mississippi were terrific. Uh, they're, they are still traumatized in many ways by this, but they opened up, they get, shared with us their possessions, they shared with us their very personal, sometimes harrowing stories, and it's all right here. What do you hope visitors can take away from this exhibit five years later? Well, I think uh, one thing is that, of course, our whole mission is to help people understand the importance of a free press. And I think that came out very strong in the coverage of Katrina. People tend to take for granted reporting. And I think the difficulty, the level of danger, and the, just the uh, persistence that the reporters had in covering this story helped people understand and appreciate why our press in America uh, really stands out and benefits the average person. Covering Katrina will be on display for the next year. And Bob, I have to say, as a native of Louisiana and as a reporter, this exhibit is a must-see. All right. Well, thank you very much, Katie. I'm, I plan to see it myself. Uh, before we uh, end today's broadcast, uh, let's take a look at a clip from the interview that we'll be airing Monday with Dr. Alveda King, the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, who will be a speaker at Saturday's uh, Restoring Honor Rally down at the Lincoln Memorial. My cousin Martin III, I think, will be with Al Sharpton, and I'll be over with Glenn Beck. Is that a divide? Not necessarily. I think you can find truth in each position, and that would be a starting point. That'd be somewhere to go. Where do we go from here? Bring the argument to, to a point where we can love each other and not hate and not argue. And let's go for compassion and truth. And you can see the full interview with Dr. King on Monday's broadcast. Thanks for watching Washington Unplugged right here on CBSNews.com. I'm Bob Schieffer. Have a great weekend and don't forget to watch television Sunday when we'll be on Face the Nation.